If you have your Bibles, we're going to be starting both in Genesis chapter 11 and then Hebrews chapter 11. So if you want to turn to both of those portions of Scripture, just to recap kind of the past few weeks, we're talking about faith and uh, faith that pleases God and how that faith, if we have the right kind of faith, is demonstrated in our lives. People around us can see our faith in action. And we've been studying Hebrews chapter 11. We're basically taking it, uh, I call it the Hall of Faith. There's many pastors that have called it the Hall of Faith. It's many men are mentioned, men and women, ordinary people, like I said last week about Noah, ordinary people that did extraordinary things through God. It was because of their faith. And we've talked about Abel, how he demonstrated that in the right kind of sacrifice. Enoch. Uh, demonstrated his faith through his walk with God, even though the world around him was living in sin, doing whatever they wanted to do. Enoch walked with God. And we, we also talked last week about Noah, how he demonstrated his faith by his act of building the ark and the fear that he had for his God and the fact that he walked with God and was just and upright again, even with the world the way it was. And how God chose to save Noah with the ark. This week we're going to talk about Abraham. We're going to be reading a few more, ver- more verses in Hebrews or that we have in the past. Um, these past few weeks it's just been a verse here and there. But this week we are going to discuss pretty much all of Abraham in Hebrews. Um, but the thing about Abraham is, you know, God was proud of Abraham. I mean, Abraham, several times in Scripture, God refers to Himself as the God of Abraham. So God was proud of Abraham. Abraham had obedient faith. Abraham had obedient faith. So we're going to talk about obedient faith today. And there's four things that I would like to share with you as far as obedient faith so we're going to start in verse number 8. We'll read all the, the verses now and then we'll uh, later on break them up a little bit for you. But starting in verse number 8, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but were persuaded, I'm sorry, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, where God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into Sunday school lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you, Heavenly Father, for this place. Lord, for a church, that we can come and worship You, Lord. But more importantly than a building, Lord, I want to thank You for the members, the people of Heritage Baptist Church, Lord. 
And Lord, what a joy it is to spend my Sundays and my Wednesdays with them. Lord, I thank You for this family. Lord, as we go through this lesson, Lord, I ask that You help us to increase our faith. Lord, and as we hear Your Word, Lord, and the promises of Your Word, Lord, I ask that You increase our faith. Heavenly Father, I ask that You be with the morning service. Lord, may You be glorified in everything that is done here today. In Jesus' name, Amen. All right, we're going to jump over to Genesis chapter 11. I told you to turn there, but I didn't have enough hands to keep a spot in there, so I'm going to take a few minutes to turn. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 27. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity and the earth of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah. The name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarah was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of the Haran, his son's son, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. So, Abraham was brought up in Ur of the Chaldees, which he was also born around 2160 B.C. The Ur of the Chaldees, or the Ur, Ur was basically southern Iraq today. So this is where Abram grew up all his life till his father had taken them and they, they moved from there. So there's four things that I want to discuss about Abraham. First thing. First thing is we need to be prepared for directions. We need to be prepared for directions. If you go back to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, the Bible says he obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. So here God called Abraham. His, his, I'm not going to go there right now, but his father in Haran. His father died in Haran. And from Haran, the Bible says that God called Abraham to go. Now, he didn't tell Abraham where to go. He just said, Abraham, go. And the Bible said that Abraham obeyed. Now, can you imagine that today? If somebody were to tell you to just pack up your family, leave your job, and just start walking. Back then, they didn't have cars. So it was all on foot. And yet, that's what happened to Abraham. And Abraham, the Bible says, he didn't question. The Bible says he didn't know where he was going, but yet, he obeyed. Yet, he obeyed. You know, we all have, and I think of Abraham, and I thought a lot about the different things. And, and by the way, there's a lot of things that we could teach on Abraham. But I want to basically keep with his faith today. But, you know, we've all got errors in our life. You know, we're kind of like Abraham. And if we want to have this faith that Abraham had when God calls us to do something, we got to be willing to leave what we're used to and obey God's voice. Our Ur is the old way of life. When we get saved, we're not supposed to hold on to the old way of life. We're not supposed to go to the same places that we always went to and do the same things that we always did. We're supposed to follow God's direction and be obedient. And here we find that Abraham, then a question. And I can't imagine, I mean, I... You know, I've, God's blessed me with a good job. 
takes care of our needs. I have two wonderful children. My wife, we have a home. I can't imagine just putting all that aside and just starting to walk. But here, that's what Abraham did. And you know what? If we want to be obedient in our faith, we need to just believe God that God knows what He's doing. And if He calls us to do something, we need to be willing to just do it. Look at Luke 9.23. Luke chapter 9.23. Verse 23 says, And He said unto them all, If any man will come after Me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily and follow me. My cross is anything that's keeping me from having the relationship that I should have with Jesus Christ. That could be friends. That could be family members. That could be Maybe things that you're struggling in your life that you know you need to get rid of. The Bible, Jesus says we need to take up our cross daily and be willing to follow His direction. If we're going to be like Abraham, we, need to start get, we just need to start moving. You know, I've, I've talked to friends over the years, especially going off to college. You know, you're looking... For God's direction, when you're when you when you're done with college, you want to you know you want to get started. You're looking for God's direction. There was a few that, and I'm not being critical, but they they kind of just waited. They just they didn't get busy serving the Lord. They just said, "Well, I'm waiting for God to tell me what to do." But we need to be like Abraham, and we just need to start getting busy, and then let God direct us. It's kind of like my daughter. She's going to be going to take her, her uh, test April 12th for driving. Don't remind her. She's already nervous enough. But uh, I just said, you know what? I kept on asking her. She kept on saying, well, I don't want it this week. I don't want it that week. So I said, okay, well, we're doing it this week. So sometimes she just needs to be. So, But she's trying to practice. So we got to get all the hours in. Well, she's not going to be able to steer that car until she starts driving. She can sit there in the car and not turn it on and just sit there in the seat and she can turn that wheel as much as she wants to. But that car is not going anywhere. She could turn it all the way to the right, but that car is going to stay straight until she puts it in drive. But what I'm saying is, until she turns that ignition and puts that in drive and starts going forward, the steering of that wheel isn't going to do anything. God wants us to be like Abraham. God has something, as Pastor said today, God's got something for all of us to do. You know, Jesus did not save me so that I wouldn't serve Him. Jesus saved me so that He could use me for a purpose. And if I want to do what God wants me to do and obey His voice, I need to not just wait for Him to tell me, but I need to get busy doing what I know is right to do and then let God lead me as I'm moving forward. Abraham was prepared for directions. Abraham was prepared for directions. Number two, number two, we need to be prepared for directions, but we need to be prepared for delays. We need to be prepared for delays. Verse number 9, it says, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. So, here if you think about it, Abraham... A hundred years after he obeyed God's direction and just started moving, he finally makes it to the promised land. But even in the promised land, he's still living in a tent. Abraham 
had to be prepared for delays. It just doesn't happen as quickly as what we'd like it to happen. By the way, the reason for Abraham's obedience was not wrapped up in explanations, but it was summed up in promises. See, God promised Abraham a seed. God promised Abraham a country. In fact, He said that this, His seed would be more numerous than even the stars of the heavens. And Abraham wasn't looking for an explanation. Abraham was just living on the promises. And it's so easy sometimes. It's human nature. When things don't go the way we want it to, or maybe not as quick as what we'd like it to be, that we look for explanations. Why is this happening? Um, why isn't this happening? But if we're going to be like Abraham, we need to not try and get the explanation, but we need to try and rely on the promises. On the promises. He lived a life like an alien, never fit into his culture. Abraham worshipped the one true God while everybody around him were pagans and worshipped many gods. Abraham's life was based on the, the words and character of God while the people around them did whatever they'd like to do. Let's look at Hebrews 11 verse 10. It says that, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Can you imagine, ladies, I mean, I, I like to camp. But even camping nowadays, you know, when I was younger, I had a tent. Then I upgraded to a, a, a pop-up, which is a little bit smaller. But can you imagine living in a tent for a hundred years, ladies? Your husband tells you, hey, we're going. God's called me. We're just going to start walking. And a hundred years later, you're still living in that tent. I don't know about you, but there might be some unhappy campers. But you know, Abraham, for the most part, was happy. We'll look at it later where the Bible says he was full of life. Now, how could he do that? Because he was looking for that promise. He was looking for that city whose builder and maker is God. Abraham was looking for that promised land. But there's another promise. We have the promised land, but you know, we also have the promised seed. Abraham, God promised Abraham a seed. God promised Abraham that his seed would be as much as the stars of the sky, the sands. But yet, Abraham and his wife were past that age. If you look at Genesis, Genesis chapter 17. So we have the fact that Abraham was continuing to look for that promised land, but then also Abraham was looking for that promised seed. Genesis chapter 17. Let's go with verse number one first. And when Abraham was ninety and nine years, ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. Now look at verse 24. And Abram was ninety years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin and Ishmael. His son was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. So we have Abraham's age at 99. If you look at verse uh, 18, verse number 2, actually we'll go to verse number 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, 
Pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Verse number 6, And Abram hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes upon the earth. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man. And he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. It was a custom back then when you had visitors that you needed to make food for them. In fact, it was kind of an insult if you had people come over, even if they were visitors, and you didn't prepare a meal. So here we have Abram, Abraham preparing a meal for these visitors. And after the meal... They began talking, and they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. Verse number 10, And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, after I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? The Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which I am old? Verse number 14, Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. So, Abraham was promised a seed. But it wasn't until Abraham was 99, Sarah was 90, that God said, you know what? Now is the time you're going to conceive and bear a son. And that promised seed that I promised you, you're now going to have, even if it's such an order. By the way, sometimes... God likes to take that impossible situation and make it possible so that He can be glorified. So that He can be glorified. See, verse number 14 says, is anything too hard? And the answer to that is no. Nothing is too hard for God. So we have Abraham's promise of a promised land. And then we have the promise of the promised seed. You know, our situations at times could, may be impossible. At least in our eyes, we might think, oh, this is impossible. God could never take care of this. But we need to understand that with God, all things are possible. And even in a situation that may not think there's no hope at all, you know, you may have things that burden your life. Maybe it's the health, your health or the health of the family member or friend, maybe it's your finances, but you got things that are going on that you're trying to figure out and you don't understand, and it may seem impossible to you, but I want to tell you today that God takes that impossible situation and He'll make that possible in your life. And by the way, I believe that God does that so that He can be glorified. See, if it wasn't really an impossible situation, something we could take care of on our own, then we wouldn't really know that it's actually our Heavenly Father that is taking care of that situation. Sometimes God allows things to become impossible in our life so that He can get the glory when that happens. And here we see in Abraham's life, not only was he prepared for directions, but he was prepared for the delays. He was prepared for the delays. Turn with me to Proverbs 3. Proverbs chapter 3. You know, sometimes with the situations that we face in our life, again, it's human nature. I've been there before where we think, you know what, if we would just, if God would just tell us why, it would be easier for us to go through what we're going through. If God would just tell us why, 
and let us know. Look at Proverbs chapter 3. I love this verse. It's one of my favorite verses. It has helped me through a lot of different things that I've gone through in my life that I that was impossible at the time. Things that I could not see any ray of light. And I didn't see any hope. Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. The end of verse 5 says, And lean not unto thine own understanding. There's a lot of times we go through things we don't understand. But God's promise to us in this verse is if we'll just trust Him. That word trust means to confide in and to depend upon. Just as a child, you know, my kids were real little, they relied on me for everything. And they still do to an extent, but as they get older, you start seeing that as they become teenagers and then they become young adults, you start seeing that separation a little bit. They're not trusting you as much as they used to. But you know what? As Christians, we need to be like that little child and trust in God in every situation. Rely on Him and confide in Him in everything that we face. But not only are we supposed to trust Him, but we also are supposed to not lean onto our own understanding. And that's hard to do sometimes. I've been there. You start asking God why. But He says, look, don't don't ask why. Don't try and figure out why things are going on. I heard a preacher one time talk about how his mom liked to do uh, crocheting. Um, I guess that's the right term. Well, it's needlepoint where you kind of go in and you have all these different colors. It's a canvas. What was it? Embroidery, that's probably what more more because it was with a needle. But he would said as a little child, he'd look up. And all these colors were just kind of like going together like a mesh. It looked like a big, huge mess. And he didn't understand what in the world was his mom doing. And the fact that she actually took classes for that, and he didn't look like it was really doing anything. But then he'd say how when his mom was done, she'd pick him up and put him on her knee and show him the real picture. And he said, you know what? Wow, that looks really good, Mom. But see, underneath, we look up and it looks like a mess. You know, down here, when we go through things, sometimes it may look like a a mess. But you know, God's the one that's working all this out. And even if I don't believe when we get to heaven, we won't really even care. But you know, when we get to heaven, we'll see the big picture. But up there are Desires won't be the same. You know, I don't know why. I don't know why my mom had cancer. She loved the Lord, gave her heart to the Lord. I don't understand why that happened. But God had a reason for it. And God has a reason for everything that we go through. Everything that you're going through, God has a reason for it. The Bible says, in all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct our paths. Just like Abraham I'm sure Abraham didn't understand. Again, he's 99 years old, and God's saying, now you're going to have, not only are you in the promised land, but you still got to live in a tent, and you're basically a stranger in the country that I promised you, but now that promised seed I told you I was going to get. By the way, those, I'm not really touching on today, but I'll hit it going by. Those verses we read talk about Ishmael. Ishmael was also Abraham's son, but it was through Sarah's handmaid. He wasn't the promised seed. See, Abraham, because he was having doubts, decided to take care of it his way. And the, all the fighting that you have in Israel nowadays, we've talked about that in Sunday school, those are all coming back to those two brothers, Isaac and Ishmael. But here, can you imagine Abraham and Sarah? We've been promised a seed. We're in a place where we don't belong. But God wants us to just trust in Him 
follow his direction. Sometimes there is delays. Sometimes there is delays. Number three. Number three, we must be prepared for disappointments. We must be prepared for disappointments. Hebrews, back to Hebrews, I might just, for sake of time, I might just stay right here, maybe a couple of different verses, but he, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, according or accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Now can you imagine... You waited till you're 99 to have a son. God finally fulfills that promise. All the excitement that comes with having a child, watching that child grow up in front of your eyes. And then God says, oh, by the way, I want you to offer your son as a sacrifice. The disappointment that Abraham I'm not sure if he told his wife. But if he did, her disappointment. But the Bible doesn't say that Abraham questioned. The Bible says that Abraham obeyed. And as much as he believed that God, because God promised him that Isaac was that chosen seed, and as much as God promised him that Isaac was that chosen seed, if he went through and sacrificed his son, he believed that God would raise him from the dead. Abraham believed God. Look at John. John chapter number 8 and verse number 56. I think this is amazing. John, John chapter 8, verse number 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see me my day, and he saw it and was glad. You know, the fact that Abraham believed God when God said that Isaac was going to be the chosen seed, and he believed that God could raise his son from the dead, God gave him a glimpse of Calvary. And that promise, even though Abraham didn't understand at that time, that promise that even as God was asking him to offer his son, that God was also going to offer his son to die on the cross for our sins. And by the way, that's essential that we believe that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. There is not a tomb somewhere or a coffin somewhere that has the bones of Jesus. As some, That tomb is empty. That stone was rolled away. Jesus is no longer in a tomb, but He's in heaven. He rose from the, from the grave. Why is that so important for us to believe that Jesus rose again? Look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him, from the dead. The gospel of Jesus is the whole picture. There are some preachers, heretics, that will try and tell you that the blood meant nothing. That it was a fact that He rose from the grave and that's what brings salvation. That man is wrong. Jesus shed His blood the Bible says without the, 
shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Jesus shed His blood, was that ultimate sacrifice, so that our sins could be paid for. But, you also have to believe that Jesus rose from the grave. You see, if Jesus was just died, shed His blood, but the tomb was still filled, then all Jesus was was a martyr for a good cause. But the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed His blood, was buried, and three days later rose from the grave proves to me that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And Abraham, as he decided to obey God and offer his son up, he got a glimpse. He got a glimpse of Calvary. And he believed that even if he were to sacrifice his son, that God would raise him up again. Now for the sake of time, we're not going to go to that portion of Scripture. But Abraham went through with it, took his son all the way up. And in fact, as they're climbing up Mount Moriah, Isaac's like, Dad, where's the sacrifice? Isaac's carrying the fire. They didn't have a lighter or uh, one of those campfire uh, starter things, matches. They didn't have any of that. They had to make the fire, bring the fire from home or whatever, but they had this fire. And, the, and Isaac had to carry the fire. And they're going up the mountain, and, and, and Abraham says, God will provide. The Bible says that they made the altar. Abraham laid Isaac on that altar. Can you imagine what's going through Isaac's mind? Laid Isaac down on that altar and as he raised the knife to kill his son, God called his hand and there was a ram in the thicket. God provided a sacrifice. But Abraham believed God, didn't question, had obedient faith. We need to be prepared for disappointments. Again, we need to be careful. We can get real discouraged if we look at the things that we're going through in life and say, God, I need an explanation. God, I don't understand why I'm going through what I'm going through. Now, we can get, that can cause us to get discouraged real easy. Maybe even Leave church altogether because we're just so discouraged. Don't understand why. God, why would you do this? God, I've been raised in a church all my life. I've obeyed what you've done. I've tried to live my life right. Why is this happening? What happens? We get discouraged. We need to forget about the explanations and just believe in the promises of God's Word, what we find in God's Word. Let's look back to Genesis 25. We're almost done. So we have, we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared for directions. We need to be prepared for delays. We need to be prepared for disappointments. Last thing, we need to be prepared for death. We need to be prepared for death. Genesis 25, verse number 7. And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life which he lived an hundred threescore and fifteen years. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. You know that phrase, full of years, means that Abraham was satisfied with his life. Abraham was satisfied with his life. Even everything that he's gone through, the fact that not only did he live in a tent, but Isaac lived in a tent, and Jacob lived in a tent, that chosen seed, they were all still living in tents in that promised land. All the trials that Abraham went through with the offering of his son, and and God asked him to do things that he didn't understand. The Bible says that Abraham was full of life. Why was he full of life? Because he still had his eyes on heaven. You know how we can be happy with the life that we're living and as we're going through life, no matter what we're dealing with and what we're facing? If we keep our eyes on Jesus, 
and we understand that this world is not our home, we're just passing through. And we keep our eyes on heaven and that promise, the promises that we have. The Bible also says that at the end of that verse, it says that he was gathered to his people. He was gathered to his people. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that day. I hope it's today. In fact, I'd be happy if it'd be right now. I've said goodbye to many friends and family. And I know one of these days, that's a hope that I gets me through it. It's the fact that one of these days I will see them again. You know what helps me cope with, with going through hard times is knowing that one of these days God's going to call us home and I'll see my mom again, I'll see my sister, I'll see my brother-in-law, and the many other people that I have had to say goodbye to, I will see them again someday. The Bible says that Abraham was gathered unto his people. Who, are, who was he gathered unto? He was gathered unto Abel, and unto Enoch, and unto Noah. The family that had gone on before him, now he was home. Now he had finally made it to that place that he had been looking for all his life. He finally made it to a city whose builder and maker was God. Abraham had obedient faith. One more verse. One more verse. Uh, Luke. Luke chapter 16. In verse 22, we won't read this whole story. Actually, we'll start with verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. We have a story of two people, a rich man and a beggar, Lazarus. We find from this story that both men live their life. But Lazarus, who was the beggar, the poor man, he was prepared for his death. The rich man, he thought he had everything. All the money he needed. The fine clothes. He didn't go hungry. He had everything that this world could possibly give him. But when this man died, he was in hell. And he said that he was in such torment in hell that he just begged for somebody to put their, wa their finger in a little bit of water and touch his tongue to give him some kind of relief. Let me ask you a question today. Are you ready? Are you prepared for death? How's your faith today? How's your faith? Are you like Abraham? I, I want to be. I try to be like Abraham. As, as we try and increase our faith, understand as we have that walk with God and we have that relationship with Him, God may ask you to do things that you don't understand, just like He did for Abraham. Are you going to have obedient faith? Are you going to have obedient faith? Abraham had obedient faith. He was prepared for directions. He was prepared for the day that God said move. He was prepared for delays. He was prepared for disappointments. And he was prepared for death. I don't know about you, but I'd like to be a little bit like Abraham today. 
Bow your heads and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you again for the opportunity, Lord, to preach your word. Lord, I ask that you be with the morning service. Lord, the songs that we sing as we worship you, Lord, in song. Lord, for the special music, may you be glorified in it. And Lord, I ask that you be with our pastor as he preaches to us from your word. Lord, the message that you would have for us to, to receive, Lord. I ask that our hearts be tender and open to what you would have for us this morning. We give you the praise and glory for everything in Jesus' name. Amen.